morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night, if you're watching somewhere else. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Are you all sitting comfortably? Yes. Fantastic. Now I'm going to tell you something that might make you feel a little uncomfortable. The majority of your lives are navigated like the lives of the herd of sheep on the left. And only a small proportion of you navigate solo, like the Lone Ranger over there on the right. Maybe you've been in a building and a fire alarm's gone off, looked around, seen that nobody else is moving, and stayed put. Maybe you've been standing at the lights waiting to cross the road, absent-mindedly scrolling through your phone and stepped out because you saw someone move out of the corner of your eye, only to be blasted back by the horn of a car and realize the lights haven't changed. Or maybe you've watched the newest, most gruesome series on Netflix because all your peers are talking about it and you don't want to feel left out. Most of us navigate our lives based on the decisions, actions and behaviors of others, our peer groups, our elders, it makes us feel safe, helps us make the right decisions. Not many people are able to stray from the herd. Not many people are willing to risk being vulnerable. Not many people feel safe enough to stretch themselves out of the compression of fear. And yet, every one of us has a story. Each of us has had an experience that if shared, could create a ripple effect so great that it changes the direction of the herd. Now, vulnerability is a term that's been popularized, used and misused in recent years. A term that has many classes, economic, technological, emotional. A term that, in the times I grew up, represented weakness, although it's now gaining in strength. Now, Understanding the dangers of a single story or one perspective, I pitched this idea to others. And the more people I shared it with, the more I realized how different our individual and cultural perceptions of vulnerability are. We can become vulnerable by wanting a career so badly we're willing to accept abuse. We can be made vulnerable by being societally labeled as less capable. And we can make ourselves vulnerable. Vulnerable to ridicule, criticism and judgment by opening up and sharing our stories, ideas and failures. And that's what I'm going to do today. Not in the hopes of being attacked, but I do accept that might happen. But with the aim of spreading the idea that by sharing first, we create space for others to do so. That by sharing our stories, it is possible to help someone have the courage to stop suppressing theirs. That by being vulnerable, despite the potential backlash of judgment, it is possible to create a ripple effect so great that it changes the direction of the herd. Now, as I was preparing to stand on this stage, I read up on the research and I watched all the talks related to the concept. And then I wrote my script and I was ready. I had all the perfectly perfect professional speaking cliches down. I was going to move you. And then I read some more articles and I watched a few more talks and I realized it might be a bit too cliche. So then I was going to give you a choice, answering my questions to share a story with a small group of people of a time you felt truly vulnerable or to move on. And just out of interest, which would you have chosen? a question. <laughs> the stories. That's really surprising. I thought you'd have said move on. <laughs> but we're going to move on. I'm not going to put you under that pressure. Democracy isn't necessarily going to win in this case. I'm going to share a bit of my story with you now. So I need to give a trigger warning. I do share a little bit of trauma. Now, if you do feel triggered, please reach out to someone for support if you need it. Like many Irish children, I grew up in a family shrouded with the shame of alcohol and abuse. Very young, I learned to detach 
I dissociated, <laughs> numbing my pain, drinking, partying, and puffing. I internalized it, letting it fester. But I wasn't aware I was doing it at the time. Working was a way to get me out of the house. I started at 11 in an office. I was doing QuickBooks by 12 and Rotas by 13 when Dad was out sick. Later, as a speech and drama teacher, I helped my mum organise her fesh, or festival. Over 30 competitions in things like poetry, prose, improvisation, with up on a thousand young entrants and their parents. The business operations made sense to me. So, naturally, I aced the business degree I was lucky enough to get into after six years of secondary school, high school for you guys, hell. And then, in my 20s, after working and living abroad for a few years, I thought I had everything sorted. I'd lost a significant amount of weight that I'd put on during a toxic relationship. I volunteered. I had really great friends and a very good career as an English language teacher. But I was still externally motivated. I'd never fully acknowledged the trauma I'd experienced. I was raised to succeed. There was little job security for teachers in Ireland at the time. So I decided to go back to business, do my master's, become a success. But as I was nearing the end of my studies, I started getting the same feeling. Now I need to achieve. And because I was so focused on external validation, so intent upon getting a role with titles, status, and security, I sacrificed my values. And what ensued was six years of repeatedly breaking the boundaries that I'd set for myself in my late 20s. Uh, my childhood was filled with laughter. But as a teenager, I was kept in environments that weren't psychologically safe. I was beaten pretty badly one night and then returned to the home after I'd run away seeking safety. I couldn't choose where I lived. Now, my parents did the best with the tools that they had at the time, and I love them dearly. But I was conditioned to accept abusive behavior. So when it happened in my relationships, whether personal or professional, physical, psychological or emotional, it didn't seem that abnormal. It was something that I was used to. And so then, after my master's, as I said, I consistently broke the boundaries that I'd set for myself in my late 20s. Because I was so afraid of upsetting people, hurting them, letting them down, I said yes when I wanted to say no. I repressed my emotions. But I wasn't aware I was doing it at the time. It was how I'd learned to stay safe. I couldn't know what was building up inside as a result of my emotional repression. And then my body imploded and exploded. Now, this wasn't physical abuse. Because I detached from my reality, because I was so consistently repressing my authentic self, living and working in environments where I said yes when I wanted to refuse, allowing myself to be verbally, emotionally, and psychologically mistreated, verbally, emotionally, and psychologically mistreating myself, my body finally said no, because I wasn't allowing my voice to. I came out in a red, coarse, itchy rash. I became inflamed. I couldn't sleep or eat properly. I was unrecognizable to myself. And a wave of awareness washed over me. A bit like this wave on Christmas Day. I realized I wasn't giving myself the love and support I needed to propel me into my future. I realized, <clears throat> excuse me, I was allowing my fear of feeling ashamed to obscure my vision of reality. And I realized that this time I had a choice. And I made a radical self-care decision that caused me to feel the deepest sense of shame and failure I have ever felt in my entire life, but equally may have saved it. I decided to share my story with a group of peers 
I'd met in a coaching program I'd recently joined. I'd only met them online three weeks beforehand. At first, I wasn't going to share. But then my coach, who has an incredible ability to create psychological safety, patiently held space. And I pushed through the fear. When I said what I felt I was experiencing, at first, there was silence. And then one woman unmiked to respond. And after her, there was another, and then another, and another. And after an hour, over seven different people had opened up and released their stories, some for the first time. Now, I've just been vulnerable in a pretty public setting. You don't get much more public than Ted. And you might think I'm telling the story to be pitied. But I pitied myself for long enough, so there's no need for that. Some of you might think I'm weak, insecure, I've overshared, or I'm unstable. Well, I'm a tough mother finisher, and I'm on the road to Sparta. You will not find weakness here. Though I will admit that the wall in front of me in that photo was insanely difficult to climb. A percentage of you will resonate. But your judgment isn't what's important. What matters is what happens next. Simon Sinek told us that the early majority will not try something new unless someone else has tried it first. They make it feel safe. And he was, of course, talking about the theory of how, why, and at what rate new ideas and technologies spread. But for ideas to spread, they need to be heard. And some ideas are so crazy that only the very brave will share them. Well, it's the same with experiences. Now, I can't speak for everyone, so I'll say that many of us have been conditioned to hide our insecurities, our embarrassing moments, our failures. Social media doesn't make it any easier, showing us every day how perfect other people's lives are, or seem to be. <laughs> now, earlier, I said I was originally going to ask you to share a story with a stranger. And you said, well, you actually said that you would choose to share the story. I'm not sure everybody would have, hence my not doing it. We seldom share these experiences because we're embarrassed, we're afraid. We aren't used to sharing them with others. Now, when you said you might share, I had thought that instead you would feel like this, and panic would strike across the room. Did some of you feel like that? Yeah, yeah OK, OK. So, Grant, I got it fairly right. So as I say, we seldom share these experiences. Because we're so ashamed or embarrassed or afraid of risking our jobs, our reputations, or our relationships, we don't want to damage our reputations disrupt the company culture at work. And so we suffer in silence. But the night I shared my story, I pushed through the compression of fear. And I created a ripple effect. So if we think a little bit about science, right, because of the conventions of TED, Einstein talked about ripple effects in space. When a ripple of energy pushes through an object, it compresses it and then stretches it. On the night I shared my story, I pushed through the compression of fear, stretching myself, pushing through the anxiety. By sharing my story, I created a ripple effect that pushed out to others, allowing them to share their stories. Their stories, in turn, gave me the courage to act. Ten days after sharing, I left my living situation, moved back home to Ireland. Five months later, I'm standing on the TEDx stage, spreading an idea. 
with the goal of creating a ripple effect so great that it changes the direction of the herd. Now, the theme today is creating tomorrow's solutions. Now, as I said earlier, I felt a bit of panic in the room when I asked you to share your stories. When tomorrow's solutions are considered, and we think about vulnerability, we can think about what's happening in organizations at the moment. They're experiencing the great resignation. But isn't it really a great migration of people leaving one arid pasture for lusher, greener ones, with leaders who aren't afraid of vulnerability and authenticity, who are willing to listen and to share? As we continue to navigate this new post-pandemic world, our understanding of suppression must change. Creating psychological safety, establishing trust, and listening to and sharing with others, despite whether or not we're ready to, is fundamental to our survival and growth. As you're herded out of this hall today, and the next time you're herded onto a train or a plane, or you herd your people into meetings, I ask you to ask yourselves, how far am I willing to allow my ripples to reach? Thank you. <laughs>